This morning's second scripture reading will remain in the Old Testament. From the weeping prophet Jeremiah, the 17th chapter of Jeremiah, verses 5 through 11. And if you're using a church Bible, that's on page 692. Again, the 17th chapter of Jeremiah, verses 5 through 11, on page 692. And Jeremiah writes, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitants. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. As a partridge that hatches eggs which it has not laid, so is he who makes a fortune but unjustly. In the midst of his days, it will forsake him, and in the end, he will be a fool. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Gracious Heavenly Father, Uh, open this passage of scripture uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, by your Holy Spirit, Lord, as only you can do to our hearts and our minds this morning. Uh, I pray that you would use me as a vessel and that I would get out of the way and uh, that you would just shine. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, folks, uh, they say a picture paints a thousand words. Have you ever looked at a picture? You got the Last Supper picture on the wall back there. You can look at it and you analyze it. You say, oh, look at this, look at that, right? Um, I'm not into uh, the arts or the cultural aspects of paintings and all that, but, you know, there are people that actually sit around, and that's all that they do all day long. They analyze stuff, and they write papers about this stuff. Uh, Picassos, Rembrandts, Da Vinci. I started to think about this. You know, they, they still talk about the Mona Lisa today, don't they? 700 years later, after Da Vinci painted that picture, they still talk about it. Uh, you know, as they say, somebody has to do it, right? Oh my goodness. That's for the socially refined, I guess. That's not for me. I I tell people I grew up on the streets of Philadelphia. That's not socially refined. Uh, But we're we're going to look at a picture this morning that a portion of chapter 17 in Jeremiah that, that God uses, that God paints for us through the prophet Jeremiah. And I would say to you that this picture is worth 2,000 words and then some. And now, chapter 17 is about matters of the heart. And if you take a look at verses 9 and 10, they are central to this chapter. It's about the condition of the human heart. And it's about the condition of the heart of Judah, the southern kingdom at the time. And God says that he knows all about the human heart. And if if you think about it from Genesis 3 all the way through Revelation chapter 19, it's always about heart issues. It's always about the relationship 
between God and man. That's the messaging of the Bible. In, in Jeremiah chapter 17, the portrait is pretty straightforward and simple. We have a heart and a life that has departed from God, and we have a heart and a life that has not departed from God. Now, some of you know your Bible a little bit better than others. I don't know what you know and what you don't know. I'm always going to assume that you don't know what I'm going to say, so I'm going to say it. But after King Solomon's reign, the kingdom split in two, and you had the ten northern tribes referred to northern Israel, the northern tribes, and then you had the two tribes, Judah and primarily Benjamin, the southern tribes. The, the ten tribes, when Jeremiah writes this, the ten tribes are already dispersed and removed from the land because of their sin. God had finally, they were, they were the worst of the two brothers, so to speak. The southern tribes now, as Jeremiah ministers to them, they're on the verge of being removed too. The question is why? Because of heart matters. Specifically idolatry. If you take a look at verses 1 through 4, it didn't have Dave read that, but in verses 1 through 4, God uses a metaphor of a stone cutter, basically etching their sins in the heart of stone. That's the imagery here. And, and so sin is etched in the heart of Judah. And here's the poignant contrast. When you think of etching something in the stone, what do you think of? This is the very, very thing that God did on Mount Sinai. And so you've got two stone tablets, if you will, one of Judah's heart, a hard stone, and then one which God puts on the Ten Commandments. And she's very contrary to what God has etched in the Ten Commandments. We can be contrary to that, can't we? Take a look. At, there's several other metaphors here that are used by Jeremiah. We have the agricultural metaphor. We're going to look at that, blessings and curses. We have the anatomy metaphor, the condition of the human heart. And then we have a wildlife metaphor, a partridge representative of a rich man. We'll talk about that very briefly too. When you come to the main metaphor, the agricultural one, it's a person who's walked away from God and a, a person who's, who, who walks with God. And, and, and as you read this chapter, we need to understand that Judah departed from the Lord. The kingdom of the southern kingdom, they departed just like the northern kingdom did. And so Jeremiah gives us this picture of what life looks like when a person departs from God or a nation. We're living in that right now. It's not a pretty one. When we stop trusting in God, we rely on self and men. That's what we do. And if you read verses 5 and 6 here, they're pretty sobering, are they not? There's, there's no life in the desert wasteland, the Arabah. The area that's being envisioned here is south of the Dead Sea. I don't know if you've ever seen stuff on the History Channel, looked at maps. I mean, that place is almost just as bad as the moon, or Afghanistan, even worse. There is only loss of life, loss of vibrancy, loss of refreshment. And I'm going to take it a step further. It's actually a picture of unbelief when it comes to God and his word. Because Judah, the Israelites had God and his word, and they departed from it. We have God and his word, and we depart, don't we? And when you read these verses, 5 and 6 here, there's no protection from the elements. The bush that is mentioned here is puny and naked. It has no fruit. It's useless, worthless. It's actually worse than a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Do you ever have it? See, ever see a Charlie Brown Christmas tree? It's a very sad, Carol, you have one, don't you? Like an imitation one, right? It's a pathetic thing. 
And, and here's the thing. Judah chose this lifestyle. They chose to be independent from God. And, and it's, now it's no longer in God we trust, but it's in self we trust. And, and you know, you know Donald Trump, he talked about, he, didn't he write a book called Let's Make the Deal, or the, you know, Make a Deal or something like that? Wheeling and Dealing. Judah, now look at this trade. Judah trades God's protection, security, shepherding, and counseling for that of the reliance upon the Assyrians and the Egyptians to help her in battle when the Babylonians invade. Now, if you're making a deal, what would you do? That's not a very good deal. And, and she thought that alliances would protect her. Boy, I tell you, I watch the Secretary of State run around the world making all these alliances. Is that really is what going to protect us? They got another thing coming. The Babylonians, I don't know exactly the time when Jeremiah wrote this, but the Babylonians were not far behind. They destroyed the Assyrians and the Egyptians. And they also destroyed it, uh, the southern kingdom too. Here are some subtleties in the text. So Judah's heart trusted in the visible, not the invisible. She trusted in men, the arm of flesh, not the spirit of God. When you, when you read the scripture, uh, the flesh is always contrary to the spirit and the spirit contrary to the flesh. There is nothing too hard for God to do, amen? Nothing too hard. And yet what we do is we oftentimes rely upon our own resources. We don't pray about things. We think that we can handle it. We analyze it maybe seven ways to Sundays. Oh, we got the idea. That's what we do. Now, the text doesn't mention this, but if you know your biblical history, about 100 years earlier, the Assyrians came up against Jerusalem the southern kingdom, under Hezekiah's ministry, because the ten northern tribes are already gone. They took care of them 20 years earlier. And there and there are 185,000 are sitting outside of Jerusalem waiting to invade. And in one night, the Spirit of God went across that camp and took them all out. And, Ju and Judah had this on record. Think about it like, I don't know, 100 years ago, and that's not too far back in the annals of history, right? They recorded everything with the kings. They chronicled their lives and the, the events. So Judah had that word of God with them, and they were dismissive of it. Now, during that time, Isaiah, it was Isaiah's ministry, not Jeremiah. T take, a look at, take a look at verse 5 here. Here's some subtle, another subtlety of the text. Cursed is the man. You might have translations that say strong man. That's actually the Hebrew word. That would be a better translation. It means mighty man, valiant man. There are two references in verse 5 to the words man. The first one is the strong man. And the second one references the weak man. It's actually the word Adam. Remember when God created Adam from the dust. He named them Adam. He came from the ground, the dust. That's frail, that's weak. And so the, the irony of all ironies here is that the strong man is depending on the weak man to help him. Uh, you know, you would think that a strong man would find a stronger man <laughs> to help him, right? No. And, and, and so what we have here is a life under a curse. And this is what a departure from God yields, a spiritually barren existence that ultimately leads to death. Uh, the life of such a person is, is likened to this puny bush. They refer to it as a juniper bush. But it's diminished, it's lacking life and vit vitality. Now, what struck me as I pondered this passage. Judah had it all. She walked with God. He blessed her. 
Remember, Israel did that under King David. I mean, they had it all. And, and they walked away. That's easy to do. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. I can do it. Who needs God? You see that all day long. It's easy to look at America, the human system, all the wealth, the greatest military in the world, you know, uh, from sea to shining sea, almost a land that's impregnable. Really? It's easy to trust in that, isn't it? We trust in what we see. We trust in intellect. We trust in education. We trust in science. We trust in technology. We trust in medicine. Strength and wisdom of others. When, does, when is God brought into that picture? Because that is all for naught if God is not brought into the picture. Amen? And so uh, it's easy to leave God out of the equation. You go and you make a decision, like I said earlier, you don't pray about it. Because, you, know, you, you, you know, you do all the math and you do all this and that and, the other, and you just make a decision. I would also submit to you, too, uh, that this is a picture of self without Christ. That's what it is. Without God's wisdom and his righteousness, his vantage point in life, uh, without his light and his truth, that's a curse, my friends. And there's a lot of people that are living under that curse. Thank God he gives us an alternative picture here. Take a look at verses 7 and 8. Uh, it's a blessed man. Now, this man too is mighty. That's literally the, the same word as in verse 5. A strong man. But he doesn't... And when I think of a strong man, I think of somebody who's got muscles, right? He doesn't trust in the arm of flesh. He doesn't trust in other men and kings and kingdoms. He trusts in God and he walks with him. He's not departed. He's dependent. He waits. He prays. And he's very happy to be in that kind of existence. Uh, notice what the scripture says. He's like a tree planted. Well watered. Deep root system. Kind of spreading out. We've got a maple tree right off the side of the driveway. That root system must go 20 feet. It's insane. Deep and happily watered. Healthy. Thriving. And, and what you, we want to do is we want to contrast that with the puny little bush. <laughs> and that's a huge contrast. And, and I would say to you that this is, verses 7 and 8 here is a a picture of life in Christ, a picture of the believer living in abundant waters. Uh, take a look at verse 13, because Dave did not read that either, but notice what it says, the Lord is a fountain of living water. And that's it's like, it's like this oasis when you consider the topography of the Middle East, right? A land flowing with milk and honey. There's no lack when it comes to the good things in life. Now, he, here's the other thing I want to say, too. Uh, notice that this life is not immune from hardship or trials or disappointment because in verse 8, it talks about the heat. It talks about drought. You know, as a believer, and you know this all too well, uh, we're not immune from hardship, right? In fact, God sends hardship to prune us. But, but the, the picture here is that it's a life that weathers the hardship, the heat and the elements. It deals with the drought of the land because it's grounded. It, there's hope and trust and righteousness and fruitfulness in God in that relationship. Uh, literally, the Hebrew reads, it's a it's a green tree, or a, a tree that has green leaves that's evergreen, although it's not an evergreen tree. But it's a tree that's evergreen. 
And, and I would say to you that this is life in Christ. It's a blessed life. It's a life that flourishes. And it's spiritually prosperous. It's not puny and diminished. It's not naked and unprotected. It's stately and strong. It's a tree. And, and trees drink lots of water, don't they? Now, I'm from Philadelphia. I got a boneheaded question for you. Do you ever wonder where that expression comes from, boneheaded question? I, I, I wondered myself, so I looked it up. I think it comes from the caveman, you know, the, <laughs> the bonehead, like the forehead. But it actually, it's an idiom, idiom that means dumb, stupid, of low intelligence. So I have a dumb, stupid, low intelligence question for you. Uh, that's not indicating your intelligence, that's like indicating mine, okay? What would you like to be in this painting or on God's canvas? This puny little naked, unprotected bush or this great stately tree? Uh, that's why I say it's a boneheaded question, right? But here's the problem. We're not talking about some sort of painting. We're talking about our lives. That's reality. That's, that's not a reality show. That's reality. And I, I think the answer is quite obvious, right? Earlier, I said that this chapter is all about heart matters and choices. So do we want to be dependent on self and the flesh, independent of God? Because that's a choice. And we can make choices, even as a believer, we can make choices all week long that can be independent of God. That's not a very good choice, but it's a choice. Or we can choose to be dependent upon God, and that's a great choice. Now, choices come down to a heart matter. And if you take a look at verses 9 through 11, uh, specifically verse 9 first, I'd like to read that. The heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Now, we see this... Uh, in culture, in our culture, we have this little kind of, you know, heart-shaped thing. It's red, and we, we have all sorts of ideas and sayings about these things. But the heart, in the Hebrew, and typically in our culture, it's all about emotions, beliefs, thoughts, the will, the intellect. And, and so what we come across are expressions like this. Follow your heart to where it will lead you, stuff like that. Let me, let me give you a few more. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Now here's another one. The human heart has hidden treasures in secret kept, in silence sealed, the thoughts, the hopes, the dreams, the pleasures whose charms were broken if revealed. Another one, the heart's memory eliminates the bad and magnifies the good. Uh, you do not have to follow, you know, you have to follow your heart, otherwise you're living a false life. I, I found these expressions online. Uh, you, you might have uh, one or two more that you could give. I'm, I'm going to spare you any more because God says the exact opposite. Of all of those philosophical and cutesy sayings, he says the exact opposite. There's nothing good in the heart. It's deceitful and it's desperately sick. Who can know it? Do you know the word for deceit is Jacob here? That's the Hebrew. It's Jacob. <laughs> it's Jacob. It's deceitful. You know about Jacob's life. For 20 some years, wheeling and dealing, deceitful, running from God. And, 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 and what God supplants, literally it's the heal, a word for heal or to supplant something. And, and, and God says it's more deceitful than anyone can ever realize. You know, I, 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 I love spaghetti. I take you know, piles of spaghetti. You know, and if you don't rinse it, rinse it real well, it's all clumped together, right? You ever un try to untangle a clump of spaghetti? 
you can't. You just can't do it. <laughs> Even if you throw lots of meat sauce on it. This is the condition of the heart. And only God can search it out and find where the strands run. He knows the depth of it, the deceit of it, the machinations and the motives and the intent. He knows it all. Uh, what is Hebrews 4, uh, 12 and 13? It's open and laid bare. He knows it all. You know, sometimes in our little heart and mind of heart of hearts, you know, we think that we're, we, we think that God doesn't see. He doesn't know. He can't figure it out. That's, a, that's an improper thought. He knows it all. So, how do we connect verses 5 through 8 and verses 9 to 11? This is how you connect it. Since there are two ways of life, why don't people choose the great stately, well-watered tree? Why did they choose the puny little bush? <laughs> because it's the condition of the heart. Why don't people choose God over self? Because it's the condition of the heart. He comes after us. You're sitting here today because he comes after us. I'm standing here today because he came after me. We make boneheaded choices. We don't choose God. He chooses us. What did Jesus say to his disciples? Without me, you can do nothing. We may find success for a little bit, but if it's not founded in God and in Christ and in his life, and we didn't make choices dependent on him, it all blows up. Uh, the way you want to understand verse 9 here uh, a little bit further, it, literally in the Hebrew, it's, a, it's an incurable sickness. It, it, it would be like our cancer today. It's, it's a, a cancer of the heart. That's what sin is. And, and there's a way that seems right as we follow our heart. But the proverb says the end is death. Now, Take, for example, the rich man here represented by the partridge. Now, I don't know a whole lot about birds. I think they're really cool. And sometimes they're very nervous little creatures, they're, but they're cool. But apparently, this type of bird, and there's some, sometimes they go back and forth about the, the specific kind of bird, but the, the, the bottom line is this kind of bird uh, sought to sit on the eggs that another bird uh, laid. And so, uh, in the end, when these things hatch, or they don't hatch, there's all sorts of discussions about whether they hatch or they don't, but the point is, the brood would recognize, hey, that's not my mom. Some have even suggested the brood kills the mom. It, it matters not. Here's the point, is that the partridge sits on Eggs that it hasn't hatched, and it's representative of a rich man who has stolen or gotten stuff unjustly by oppressing the poor, and he's got all this wealth, and then his life is eventually taken from him, and he never hatches those riches. That's the parallel here. He dies. He's a fool because it all remains unhatched. And here's, here's the other thing that you want to gather here. When you depart from God, or you never walk with God, you're kind of in a wicked state. And this rich man, apparently his life was like that. He was self-dependent, self-sufficient, did things his own way, and it all came to naught. And so the fool would be a euphemism for a very wicked person who left God out of decisions in life. And, and by the way, it, it fits perfectly with verse 10 because verse 10 says, I the Lord search the heart. I test the mind. I give to each man according to his ways and results and deeds. And so 
Jeremiah gives us one simple example. That's how we connect the verses here. One final thought. The heart is at the heart of the matter. God searches the heart. He knows it's deceitful and depraved. Depraved means we can't find our way back to him. And so this is why he sent Jesus Christ. To sort out that bowl of spaghetti in the heart. To send the Holy, resurrect from the dead, make payment for sin and the penalty, and send the Holy Spirit into our life and heart so he can overwrite that sin that's etched in the heart and have us depend on him rather than on self. And when we do that, when we accept Christ into our life and we depend on him, then his spirit can override the fleshly decisions. Because that's not a very good picture, right? And so that changes everything. Because you know that when you make that decision, you're a new creature in Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's like basically trading verses 5 and 6 in for verses 7 and 8. Nothing's perfect, but as you go through life and you depend on God more and more and more, that tree grows more stately and strong and more green and more beautiful. Amen? That's the picture. It paints a thousand words, and life in Christ is better than any Picasso, any Rembrandt, and any Da Vinci, and even the Mona Lisa. Uh, that's what God has laid upon my heart this day. Um, life without Christ, life in Christ. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward portrait, um, and it's a very simple choice. Let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for the word of God, which stands forever. And Lord, forgive us uh, in our times of unbelief where we seek to do things in our own strength, our own intellect, our own wisdom, uh, in our own righteousness, uh, with education and our own thoughts, whatever it may be, where we don't rely upon you, we don't give things to you. Uh, forgive us during those times where we have departed and have been self-sufficient. Uh, thank you for sending your spirit into our life and our heart to depend upon you to make decisions that are in the spirit, not in the flesh, uh, to have a life in Christ that is prosperous, flourishing, um, blessed, and nurtured uh, by the spirit of the living God. And we thank you. We thank you for that. Uh, thank you for our time together, for each heart that's here. I pray that you would water each heart and sow your word deeply into each heart. Uh, mine first, uh, 